Chancellorsville campaign when this started. Lee got the idea for it. It was a good time, maybe, to uh, invade Pennsylvania. And he had uh, several goals in mind uh, that uh, of what a campaign here would do. And uh, what he figured was he, he only had two forces of action after Chapelville. Sit down on the defense again and just keep taking hits and you're never going to win on the, on the defense. You have to take the offense at some point. And he thought the second thing would be uh, leading us all for a campaign into Pennsylvania and take the war north. And there were several things that he could do by doing that. Uh, uh, he liked his second course of action. He could do several things. The invasion would, number one, take the war out of Virginia, take it into the enemy. Uh, it would uh, allow the army to subsist off the rich, undamaged areas of Pennsylvania. Three, if successful, it, it would probably increase the likelihood of foreign intervention on the side of the Confederacy. Uh, fourth, it could possibly provide relief of the siege of Vicksburg and down on the mountain. And it might possibly cause the peace movement in the north to increase. So on May the 17th, Lee received permission from Jefferson Davis to begin the campaign. He next reorganized his army. He used to have the two corps uh, under Longstreet and one under Jackson. But Jackson's not here, and he knew he didn't have the talent to replace Jackson. No one could replace Jackson. So he created a, a new third corps. So the 2nd Corps, Jackson's old corps, were now going to be commanded by Richard Ewell. Now Ewell was an interesting character. He had lost a leg. He had been an adequate, very adequate division commander under Stonewall Jackson, but at 2nd Manassas he had lost a leg. Uh, and uh, uh, he was just back in the army from recovering from that. Of course, he had a wooden leg. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about that wooden leg later. Uh, but... Uh, so he had part of Jackson's old 2nd Corps, and the new 3rd Corps was created with A.P. Hill as a commander. A.P. Hill had been a very aggressive, a very good division commander. But as we, we're going to find out in a lot of cases, you know, both armies, people, they kind of maximize out where they do the very best job, and above that, they don't do a very good job. A.P. Hill was one of these. He was fairly adequate as a uh, Corps commander. Uh, this was, is going to happen later to Hood. Hood was an incredible division commander, but when he got higher levels, he just didn't do a very good job. It was above his pay grade, as we like to say in the Army. Yeah. Uh, so he re reorganizes the Army, and uh, one of the uh, things about this, they decide they're going to start getting north and they're all around still around the Fredericksburg area so what he does is he decides to start sending uh, one of his units uh, on the 3rd of June they begin moving north Ewell's Corps moves first and they strike out and they head down the Shenandoah Valley they, they get to Winchester and force a fairly large federal government to defeat that take a lot of prisoners, they capture a lot of cannon, a lot of supplies, a lot of stuff. And it looks like to Lee at this point that Ewell was a good choice. He was very good in independent command like that. He did a very good job. Uh, and it was, uh, let's see, they had uh, over 5,000 Federals surrendered uh, at Winchester. On the 15th of June, Lee's other two corps began their movement through the Shenandoah Valley. And they said they moved so fast, one of them quoted as saying it was breakfast in Virginia, whiskey in Maryland, and supper in Pennsylvania. Now, another interesting thing, and I know you all heard about this, Jeb Stewart, the excellent uh, cavalry commander, but a bit on the flamboyant side. Uh, so he proposed to Lee that, you know, the I scout to the east around and find the Federal Army, because at this time, the Federal Army is still down around they're all there and maybe a little bit around uh, to the south back toward Culpeper a little bit uh, so
So he proposes to leave it. Well, I, I kind of scream and let you know where the panels are. And Lee gave him an order says, yes, you were approved, but as soon as you cross the McClellan River, you're to feel for the right flank of our army and stay between our army and the federal army. And Lee was very explicit about that. Uh, however, we're going to find out when uh, Stewart starts that movement, he gets a little out of line and he goes a little bit too far to the east. And all of a sudden, he finds their federal forces between him and Lee's army. And every time he tries to get back, the Federals are right there with him. So he just keeps getting moved around, around, and around, and around. And this continues on, so he never gets back in touch with Lee's army. He's totally away from Lee's army. And a lot of people say, well, instead of keep going on that way, maybe what he should have done is turned around and come back and, and got back in, but he didn't. Uh, but this takes him totally away from Lee for the whole very beginning of this campaign. In fact, Stewart was not going to make contact with Lee's army until the second day, July the 2nd. So he's totally out of contact. And your cavalry is the eyes and ears of the army. And uh, he's out of position. And this is one of the greatest faux pas that Stewart ever commits is being out of touch with his army. And it leaves Lee blind, and it's going to have very significant implications as this campaign goes on. Uh, the uh, 26th of uh, June, Jubal Early's division of Ewell's Corps passes through Gettysburg, right through here, headed east. They're headed toward York and also the Susquehanna River, because there's a big bridge down to Columbia that they think they want to get across on to coordinate their, eventually they want to get Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All, all the army wanted to get Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, so they passed through Gettysburg on the way to Harrisburg via York and sent word back to A.P. Hill that there was some sort of a shoe factory in Gettysburg. That was, it was, if it was, it was a small one. It wasn't a great big massive shoe, but it was, a, you know. And one of the interesting things, shoes, shoes. Uh, th those old brogans, if you were marching, rarely lasted longer than about 100 miles. And if you look at the route they made from uh, Fredericksburg down and down the valley and around to get here, it's right at 100 miles. So the shoes were starting to wear out. Probably been kind of handy to find, you know, if you could get any kind of shoes at all. So it, it was, it was a uh, uh, a nice treat to be able to find shoes if you could, if your shoes were wearing out. And of course, it, that, the supply levels were pretty bad in the Confederate Army. The shoes went bad; you went barefoot. Not pleasant. Uh, Robert Rhodes' division marched through Carlisle and camped near Harrisburg on the 28th, but uh, after Lee received reports of the Federals in Northern Maryland, he ordered the concentration of the Army at Gettysburg. Now, what he did to start with, Lee did not know quite that it was going to be at Gettysburg, uh, but he assumed, because they were back west of the that Ridge of Mountains, they were back in Cashtown, uh, farther west and they made a turn and started heading this way. Initially he, he started saying it'd be at Cashtown, then he realized they're going to be closer to Gettysburg and it had a better road network here. So he, he changed and said meet back here at Gettysburg. Now Ewell's Corps has gone on, they, they get down to the Susquehanna River and they get ready to cross the river and the Federals that have come back across Bridge, but again, can't get across the river. Have any, have any of y'all ever seen the Susquehanna at that point on Highway 30 going east? Mm -hmm. It's about three quarters of a mile wide. Mm -hmm. Not terribly deep. Mm -hmm. Good job ahead, y'all. <laughs> uh, so they couldn't cross the river, so that kind of stuck back. So he turned around, and of course, he got the edge and came back. 
Now you see in the movie Gettysburg about the spy Harrison. He was a real person. And he was really doing that job. He was a scout for Longstreet. He was a state by Longstreet to try to find the Federal Army. And he was really was the only person who brought back word that the Federal Army was not where they thought they were. They were a whole lot closer, which caused a lot of problems. So all of a sudden, Lee, without his cavalry, says, golly, we're going to have to get concentrated fast. Because remember, he got his army separated the fall before going into Sharpsburg campaign, and he didn't want that to happen again. So what he did is he said, concentrate at Gettysburg. And remember, this is the order that you will receive in Earl and everybody else. Come to Gettysburg. I'm going to figure a little bit later. Um, so they all start heading this way. Now, the day before, and we're going to get ready to go across the road in just a minute. The day before all this action occurs, of course, you know, the armies have come. And this is what in, in the military we call a meeting engagement. Both sides are kind of coming together. The Federals have finally moved, and they come up with a plan. Now, Hooker had been in command of the Army of the Potomac, and Hooker was an individual who was, uh, he liked to boast a lot, and I always liked to think when, when he was first appointed as commander of the Army of the Potomac after the disaster of Fredericksburg and Amberg Burnside, he went around boasting and says, well, Mr. President, uh, when I get us into Richmond, we're going to do this, and whether you like Lincoln or not, most of us don't like him. But the man had a way with words and, and agricultural phrases. And he used this. He said, General Hooker, do you know that the hen is the most is the smartest of all the animals? The hen, he said, yes. The hen never cackles until the egg is laid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and that was sort of an admonishment. Don't go boasting about Richmond until you get there. You think? So, of course, Hooker never did. Now, Hooker was in command at Chancellorville, did not do a very good job, lots of blunders there. And Lincoln and Halleck, who was a, kind of the chief of staff of the Army, were wondering how can we get rid of him without really tanking the morale of the Army that's already pretty bad. Uh, and they said, well, we're, if, if an opportunity presents itself, we'll go with it. Now, Lee's Army is moving up they're coming through, and Hooker proposed to Halleck that they withdraw the garrison that's at sort of around Harper's Ferry and Maryland Heights because they had gotten trapped there during the uh, course of surrender during the uh, Charlottesville campaign, federal garrison, the largest surrender of U.S. forces into a battalion in World War II. Uh, and Halleck said, no, we're going to leave them right there. And this is one of those things that, that this a, it's a military lesson, lesson for a lot of people. Uh, Hooker said, well, if you don't do that, I'll resign. This is exactly what Lincoln and Halleck wanted. And he gave them the opportunity. He said, we accept your resignation. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't, yeah, don't do something, don't make a boast and think that, yeah, I'm, I'm on good solid ground because you may not be and you may be forced to eat what you say. Yeah. So this is what happened. They replaced Hooker, and it was at 3 o'clock in the morning on the, I think it was 26th or 27th. Uh, yeah, on the 28th, Hooker was relieved and replaced by George Meade. And I always liked Meade's um, comment about this. He wrote his wife and said, uh, I, I really didn't want to take it, but uh, I guess I have been tried and sent to execution, uh, and so I've got to do it. So he came in, there was no plan for the Army. Hooker left him with no real plan. They had started moving this way, and the, they, he was told that he had to protect Baltimore and Washington. So when he started moving, he broke up the Army of the Potomac into three kind of wings. Mike Bird has got three wings. Uh, there are two corps, 1st and 11th, that were going to come the farthest west, and they were going to come uh, around this way and come up through Emmitsburg, Maryland, and come through here. That was, uh, let's see, there were five corps, corps that 
we're going to kind of come up through the middle up through about round Pawnee Town. And then there was two cores that were going to, oh, excuse me, one core that was going to be farther to the east that was going to come over. And so they didn't know exactly where the Confederates were. They hadn't found them yet. They knew they were up here, but not sure where. But there was general panic for all of this into Pennsylvania because the, the Confederate Army was here. So they, they knew they were here, but not sure exactly where they were going. Uh, so Meade said these three prongs, three wings of the army, and converged towards Gettysburg. Uh, so we have both armies. All of a sudden, Gettysburg becomes the point where they're coming to. So now they're headed. So we get to the day before, the 30th of June. Heath's army uh, division is in front, and they're this way to the west. They're at Cashtown. And uh, he orders uh, Pettigrew's brigade, which was the lead brigade that day in the marching order, to go into Gettysburg. And he said, uh, there shouldn't be anybody there, but possibly some local militia. But if you should happen to run into the Federal Army, don't bring on an engagement. <clears throat> So Pettigrew leads his force in. They come down uh, the Chambersburg Pike. They come through here. And they probably get over here to Seminary Hill. And they look off to the south and they see clouds of dust coming up. And it's Buford's Cavalry Division, which has been attached to that left wing of the Army, those two corps, the first and the corps, and told the scout ahead to find out what's in Gettysburg. So he, as, as um, Pettigrew looks over the distance, he sees who stops, and he looks, and he says, that cannot be militia with all that dust. It's got to be cavalry. So he looks at the desk, he sees federal cavalry. And he remembers his orders, so he turns around and retreats and heads back, because that was his orders. Um, and Buford comes on in, and you saw in the movie, it portrayed that, that you saw very odd, very strange, Confederate infantry, no cavalry, and they're turning around going back. Uh, so Buford comes in and, and occupies the town, and he comes out to it, and basically he sets up a line right here, on the Pearson's Ridge, right here, facing west, because he knows there's Confederates that way. And uh, if you remember from the movie Gettysburg, he sends that message off. He's sitting there in front of the uh, seminary. He's writing the message that he's here. And he's there for the north. Uh, I'm holding the ground and I'm waiting for orders in the morning. Now, what Buford did was perfect cavalry. He came in. He saw good ground. He held it. And he sent it. Uh, word back to his com immediate commanders what's going on, what he sees, what he's doing, and what do you want me to do. I'll hold it until you tell me otherwise. So this is where we're getting ready to go into the very first day's action. Now, let's walk across the street be very careful. They were militia. No, sir. They were cavalry. They were riding horses. <laughs> um, so... They're still having this discussion, and A.P. Hill shows up for commander. And they continue the discussion, and they kind of discounted Pettigrew because he had not been to West Point. He was not a West Pointer. All the other guys were. I mean, it still happens. I know. If you're not a West Pointer, you get discounted. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so they, they continue the discussion, and A.P. Hill says flatly, there are no federal of the Army of the Potomac in Gettysburg, period. End of discussion. So General Heath turns to Hill and says, well, General, if you have no objection, I'll take my division and go into Gettysburg tomorrow and get those shoes, those reported shoes. And to which A.P. Hill replies, none in the world. 
there's going to be a dangerous battle that the Civil War is going to be started on conversation, just like that. So, A.P. Hill uh, gets command and he's going to move in. Of course, he's told they're under orders, do not bring on a general engagement. In other, in other words, a big fight. You know, if you have a little skirmishing, that's one thing, but don't bring on a major, major battle because the army is not up yet. Okay, you've got Ewell still up. Now, they have turned and now they're headed to Gettysburg. Uh, and they've been moving down to a pretty good cliff, all coming back toward Gettysburg. From the north and the east. You've got AP Hill's corps, who's back to the west along the Chambersburg Pike from Cashtown back. Now, that night before, uh, when Pettigrew pulled back, he didn't go all the way back to Cashtown. Down here, I didn't drive out there later today or tomorrow morning if you want to drive out there, we can. Uh, but Marsh Creek is about two to three miles back, and that's as far back as they went. It was a good, good, it's a nice, good sized creek. They, they went on the far side of it and they built the whack there. Kind of the spear point of the army at this point. Uh, and there they wait. Now, in most of these armies, you rotate in the division, you rotate. The marching order of your brigade. So the brigade that's leading today may be the last brigade, and the next can kind of move up. So in the normal marching order, the Pettigrew's brigade is going to be the last brigade forward on July 1st. The two brigades that come up are General Archer and General Davis. Davis. He's kin to Jeff Davis. Maybe he's a nephew. Uh, so they, they start the road up here, of course, again, they're told not to bring on a general engagement. Well, they come across, come through the, the 26 line, or the, the uh, Pettigrew's Brigade, and they're coming up here, and they get over here, the next ridge over is her ridge, and the cavalry has um, pickets out that far. So they start firing shots, pickets to take some pictures. force the enemy to deploy, slow them down, let out all you people back here uh, know what's happening, what's coming. So here they come. The pickets fire, and with the veterans deployed to a degree, they're still coming. Of course, the pickets fall back, that's the deal. So they get up here, and this is the main line of deployment for the cavalry. So they start firing. Archer's Brigade is coming, it's kind of, they go and go south of the road. And they're coming up this way. They deploy out and come this way. That is the brigade kind of swings out. And right over here, you can see there's not a head road, the railroad track. It's completed now. In July of 1863, the railroad had only gotten as far as Gettysburg but they had done the major grading work and it was, the cut was there, a railroad cut. So they're coming forward. Davis brings his guys up and all of a sudden they run into that cavalry and they're putting up a pretty good fight and they are forced to deploy to, to, to go into a deliberate attack on both sides of the cavalry over here too. And they start getting driven back and then they come back again. Now what happens on this side of the road is Davis's guy figure we slip through that railroad cut. So a bunch of them go into that railroad cut. Well, what, what does that do when you go on something like that? Put you down. You, you down low, yeah. yeah, but what's what's happened when the when the other side is up on top? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're trapped. <laughs> so a bunch of them can get into that and they're actually a little farther up and they get trapped and they're told Muskets down, you know, surrender or we'll shoot you down. So there was a bunch of them that surrendered. Really? Yeah. A bunch that surrendered. Confederate surrendered. So Davis's command is pretty much stripped and they just kind of hold here because they, they can't go anymore. Now Archer's coming up and getting in the line. Now, going back to the federal side of this action, you had John Buford and uh, uh, most of the uh, Union generals, he is my favorite. Because the guy is, he is a genius at what he does in fighting. He's, 
he was underappreciated by the, uh, the Federal Army because he was from Kentucky. And anybody from Kentucky was under suspicion. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but he was probably one of the better generals in all of the Federal Army, especially cavalry. Uh, so Buford's right here. Yeah. And how thick a line was it? Well, it was it was not shoulder to shoulder. It's not like a line of battle. They were probably eight to ten feet apart. But and see, the, it, but they're shooting faster because they got carbines. But they're covering a mile. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how how far? Pro probably much, probably a, a close to a mile. Okay. So they're all across here. They they actually extend into the woods just a little ways. But now Buford has not been uh, silent. So anyway, uh, there's a lull on the battlefield here. Now, Heath was told back here not to bring on an engagement. He did. Mm -hmm. Lee could hear this going on, and he was back at Cashtown, and he's pretty disturbed by this. What's going on over there? Because he could hear the cannons. Both sides had cannons in now. So Confeder Confederates had got some of their cannon in with shelling, you know, back and forth. And uh, this was kind of disturbing to Lee. And he, so he said, I've got right for him to find out what's going on. So he gets up here and uh, finds Heath and he says, what's happening, General Heath? And again, the movie does a pretty good job of this encounter. Uh, well, General Lee, I, my, my boys got up and we got pushed back. And I couldn't just let them have it. We had to take them. We had to push them off. So we tried it again and got pushed back. And then Federal Infantry came up. And Lord, we were in for it then. We, it was all, you know, and uh, it got to be a pretty pitched battle, of course. So you have two of Heath's brigades. I call them Heath Heath. That's different people pronounce it. It's H-E-T-H. -H. I think it's Heath, but it could be Heath. But anyway, uh, so these two Archers and Davis's brigades get handled pretty roughly and they're driven back. So the Federals are all in here, especially in this area here. This, this is a pretty good, well, the road was not here then, the slope you know, just came right on, but this is right over, it's pretty steep down to Willoughby Run right down there. It's about 40, 50 yards down there is Willoughby Run. Uh, not a big creek, you can step across it at any place. It's not big at all, it's probably 10, 12 feet wide and maybe six inches deep okay. and regularly, regular times. It's a creek. Uh, so the, what's left of Archer and, and Jones, uh, Davis' brigade pull back across to the other side over here. Now, while that early attack was going on, Pettigrew's brigade files in to this side and they're back up on the far ridge over here. And Mayo's brigade, Virginia. We'll find out about Mayo a little later. Uh, and it actually, at the time, it was Brockenboro leading the brigade, uh, Virginia Brigade, and they were on the north side of the road, waiting, because Lee told them, do not attack, the army is not up. And of course, he dresses down General Heath pretty good about, that, that is General Heath while we have orders yeah. not to do something, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. You know, anyway. Uh, so there's kind of a lull here for a while, and um, Lee comes up and finds out, and, and this is kind of happening at the same time, there's action that's only happening on the north side from Ewell's guys coming down, and all of a sudden there's going to be some stuff happening over there. I don't want to, don't want to spring the trap yet about what happened over there, but, but this is happening in the yeah, interim yeah, here. Yeah. So when the action starts on this north side, uh, Lee sees that looks like Ewell's troops are gonna flank the Federals up there off of Oak Hill. And so he says, this is an opportunity. So he orders General Heath, you may now launch your attack because now you've got more of A.P. Hill's division coming up and Dorsey Pender's division is coming up now. So mm -hmm. he's got, now he's got two divisions. Of course, he's had two brigades that have been handled pretty badly and taken severe losses. But he's got two, and he's got Pettigrew's brigade, which is probably the largest brigade in the Confederate Army at this point. 
and you've got in 26 North Carolina that's the largest regiment in either army here, a little over 800 men, uh, and they're over here, and shortly after lunch when the attacks start up here, Lee says to General Heath, you may now start your attack over here. So they start their attack, and as they come down through here, uh, 26 is in a lot of battle, they start taking fire, some pickets and whatnot, they return some fire and they start coming into here. Now, when they get down at the bottom of the Willoughby Run, they face all of this. And the Federals are up here in force. And now they've extended their line. You can see through the gap there, you can see it looks like a field in the distance. And yeah. if you get out of this bottom and get up, you'll see that this, uh, McPherson's Ridge extends right on down to the Fairfield Road. The and the Federals have come up yeah. to that point, pretty much oh. First Corps. Um, and we're just talking about first yeah. corps now over here but now the 11th corps has come through behind and they're going over toward oak hill mm -hmm. we'll, we'll start covering them a little bit later yeah. so we got and the, and the word is, is given to launch this assault so pettigrew's brigade comes up through here and right in here is where the 26 now i'm biased i'll admit it 26 comes up through here and uh, the six, uh, of course, they're over on the other side of the field in, in different, but we have the 11th North Carolina, the uh, uh, 42nd, 52nd here. There's one of the regiments that's back guarding uh, wagon train, wagon trains, and the bridge back up, still back in Virginia, that's left back over there. Uh, so they come up through here and launch this attack against the Iron Brigade that has never yielded ground in the entire war. The 26 hits the 24th Michigan and the 19th Indiana of the Iron Brigade, two of their regiments. And pretty heated battle, they move through here, they start losing color bearers. And this is one of the things, your color bearers are, you know, you talk about killing the leaders to kill the color bearers first. Because in those days, that was what the troops guided on was the regimental flags. Wherever those flags were, that's where you went. Mm -hmm. And if you could shoot down the enemy's color bearers, at least for a couple of minutes, that took that away until they could get somebody else to get the flag up and move forward. So in the course of this battle, the 26 comes up through here, over 800 men. And they're going to fight their way through this way. They're going to drive the Iron Brigade back uh, and continue to drive them. There are three successive lines between here and the top of the hill that the Iron Brigade sets up. And the, largely the 26 North Carolina blows them out of each one of them, but at a terrible cost. Of a little over 800 men, there are 588 casualties in a little over 30 minutes of combat. 588. Now they're not all killed. It's 88 that end up being killed. But you've got around 500 that are wounded in some degree, from slight wounds to, in some cases, there end up being more wounds, amputate, you know, the whole gamut uh, out of this. But they drive the Iron Brigade, which had never been driven before. How many casualties did they have? Okay, I can just talk. Well, the, the Iron Brigade came in and the uh, 24th Michigan, which we fought opposite here, they had a uh, little less than 500 men in their regiment, and they're going to lose 300 of them. Uh, when this action is over, the Iron Brigade. And when it's through, they're going to go back and be posted back on the other side of Cemetery Hill. They don't fight again. Really, they don't fight again for the rest of the battle because they shot all the pieces. Uh, and six were shot all the pieces too. But the Iron Brigade does not fight again during this battle. It's just over there in reserve. Yeah. They're shot all the pieces. All the regiments in there. There's two Wisconsin regiments in Indiana, 19 Indiana, and North Michigan. Uh, see, there's one more regiment. Uh, but anyway, it's interesting, and of course, in the reenacting community, we do, of course, obviously 26 North Carolina, we do the 24th Michigan if we do have to do a federal impression. 
and on there's a 24th Michigan reenactment unit. They do the 26th North Carolina when they do Confederate. Mm -hmm. And there have been times, <laughs> there have been times, uh, we do reenactments up here at, at Gettysburg. And of course, the first day we fight against each other. There's a bond. We just about score each other. <laughs> On the third day action, generally you'll have the 24th Michigan guys that will come over and ask if they may join us as Confederate. And we always let them in, and they they come in. So and and you know they really understand what an honor yeah. it is. Those yeah. guys from Michigan now, and so we're all together, and we on the third day's action. Um, I'm not going to take us through there because it's probably pitch yeah. and everything else this time of year. This is why I like to do these things when it's cold weather. <laughs> you don't have leaves. You can see the ground very good. Yeah. Uh, but there are two or three points up there. There's a little dry creek bed. There yeah. was one of the lines. There was another little line farther back up, and then they're going to get to the top of the hill. Now the rest of yes, <laughs> I can't help it. All right, we did the we did the 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 length of a battle line exercise coming up here. Mm -hmm. You know how wide's a man, yeah. and then you can correlate how long the battle line is. So he and I did the math. The 26 North Carolina's front would have been 600 feet long. Yep. Two which is, which is 200 yards. Yep. Yeah. Two, two football fields. Two football fields long. Right. And if that's the center, roughly, then you got to go a whole football field that way. Yeah. And a whole football field that way. Yeah. yeah. That's battle line. So that, that's why the, the 26 ended up taking on all of the 24th Michigan and most of the 19th Indiana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, the 26, I believe, was the left flank of yeah, Pettigrew's brigade going up. So the rest of it was all this way. And they went into the Federals and started driving them back. Okay. Uh, 11, and, if, and if you don't, take, take a moment to read this while we're Maybe Don's going to play the Illinois State for us while we're here. within 20 yards or so in the wood. And when, I like to say, I'm not going in there traipsing around with ticks and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was in there a little ways and um, they're driving, continuing to drive the Iron Brigade back, back, back. And of course, in Civil War tactics, you were always taught to dress on the color, dress on the color. So the 26 from being 600 feet across is getting small. It's dress on the color, dress on the color, dress on the color. So it's shrinking constantly. So it's getting up here. And it gets in. 
and it starts to drive the iron brigade back across and when they get to this point in a driven this is the last stand of the iron brigade is right here and when they get pushed and driven back their next place to get is over there on cemetery or seminary ridge so most of them take off at a good trot what's left of them now the color bears keep going down and finally on both sides oh yeah okay but especially on the 26th side there we go. they keep yeah. going down or gwen's going down and finally john lane the lieutenant colonel gets the colors and uh, somebody says well, colonel you won't live with them and said it's my time to take them now <laughs> so the 26 gets up here and starts driving and there's one guy in, in the 24th Michigan, it's a sergeant, a, a John McConnell, um, gets across and he gets out about 20, 30 yards out and he, he has picked up a cavalry carbine because he's out of ammunition with his musket. But he picks up one of those cavalry carbines from the early morning's action just laying on the ground. And he looks back and he sees this Confederate officer with a beard and a battle flag. And with the last shot he has, he aims at him and fires. The bullet hits uh, Lane right through his open mouth. It comes out the back. Doesn't doesn't hit his spinal cord. It does not hit any of the major veins or arteries. That's a miracle. Got a few teeth and it clipped his tongue, but it went out. It was, of course, he goes down, somebody else picks up the flag, and they, and by now, pretty much, the, the action is, the 26 is about shot. They're, they're down just two or three, a couple hundred men left moving forward, they're out of ammunition, and this is about the time that Dorsey Pender's division comes up and deploys online, and where you have scale fit. I'm sorry, I do not have a map for scales for that with Dorsey Pender's action on. We can find one. We can find one. Uh, so they push and continue pushing. The, the attack goes through the 26th, and, and some, of, some of the guys in uh, Pender's division says as they went through the men of the 26th, they were foaming at the mouth, screaming, just, you know, it's absolute terror and what they've been through for the last 30 minutes I, I i can't imagine but they push the federals on back all along this line uh Pender's division goes all the way to the woods that you can see to the fairfield road and they push the federals back push and the federals realize that first corps has been beat up pretty badly along here and their best shot is to get through town and get on the other side of town and go back up on Cemetery Hill. Uh, there is, though, is uh, part of uh, Brockenburg Brigade and a little bit uh, on here, as they're coming forward, there's a artil uh, federal artillery position where just the other side of that little snake rail fence and you see some little trees like it's a little... They were set up along there and, and a little bit across the road there behind where Lee's headquarters. And they wreaked pretty much havoc on part of Brockenburg Brigade, some of those guys, uh, firing into them before they were finally forced to withdraw. Um, now, what happened to Lane? Badly wounded. They thought it was a mortal wound. The man survived the thing. He got up, he was he was carried to the rear and he, he it took him a month or two to recover from that. Uh, and he always talked with a lift after that. He talked a little bit because his tongue had been cut. But he became an orator after the war, a very famous orator after the war. He respected North and South because Lane is gonna be wounded four times, three more times during the war. Mm -hmm. And, sub and survives it all and doesn't lose anything except a couple of his teeth and a little clip on his tongue. tongue. A little clip on his tongue. No way. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. But um, 
So anyway, so this action pretty much, this kind of ends the action on this end of the field the first day, first day. They push the Federals back. They're getting back through town. Now, we're getting ready to go up on the north end of the battlefield, Oak Ridge. Now, so far, we've only talked pretty much about First Corps on here. Now, a little bit back earlier in the day, Buford, when he's still on this field, hears about his scouts are out, and they say there's Confederate troops coming down the Newville Road from Car and the Carlisle Road. The road's back this way. We'll go, go over it in just a few minutes. And so Buford takes his second brigade, which is still facing this way, and kind of refuses his flank and turns them back. So he's got an L shape across that front, but it's thin. And uh, after the action here with First Corps, Eleventh Corps is starting to come into town. So, Doubleday is here. Our old buddy, O.O. Howard, is still commander of 11th Corps. He did that disastrous job at Chancellorsville. O.O. Howard is still smarting from the rebukes he received for the action at Chancellorsville. He sees some of these 1st Corps troops retreating back from this point to start with, they stopped a little while over here on Seminary Ridge. He sends a message back. The first corps has now broken and are fleeing in, in, in disorganized retreat. Do you think he was a little self-serving? Mm -hmm. A little revenge. But Howard, he does do one thing good. He has three divisions and most of them are still German. Like most of them, everybody said they're Dutch. No, they weren't Dutch. They were German. They were Deutsch. 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 Which, well, to, the Deutsch. English, to the English ear, it must mean Dutch. No, it's Deutsch. Deutsch. There's no such thing as Pennsylvania Dutch. It's Pennsylvania Deutsch. We've anglicized it. Mm -hmm. So it's Dutch. There ain't no Dutchman. Anyway, uh, so he takes two of his divisions uh, and... He is now the senior commander on the field because Doubleday is just a division commander. Howard is a level four commander, so he takes charge of this. So he takes two of his divisions and sends them north to kind of fill in that cavalry stream that's going off toward the east. But one thing he does um, is he leaves one of his divisions stay on Cemetery Hill, which is going to end up being very fortuitous for the Federals, and he only takes two of the divisions for it. So let me go into this a little bit. Uh, so at around 11 o'clock a.m., this early lull falls over the battlefield. The Iron Brigade has resumed its position along McPherson's Wood and Cutler's Brigade has moved back to McPherson Bridge north of the railroad cut. A short time earlier, Howard's 11th Corps arrives on the field ahead of his troops and observes Cutler's troops breaking for the rear. And this wrongly assumes uh, that they're fleeing in disorder. At about 1230, Howard receives news that a large body of Confederate infantry is approaching from the north. Shortly afterwards, Confederate artillery from Rose Division gets up on Oak Hill, and we're going to go up there shortly. But if you look up here, you see a tall looking monument right through the trees. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. yep. that's, that's the Eternal Peace Monument on Oak Hill. Now, that position commands the entire. When we get up there, you'll see, you see everything over here. So, Robert Rhodes comes down, and he sees, well, that's, of course, he's coming from the other side. He says, man, that's a pretty tall hill. He's up there. So he rides up there and says, uh huh. So he orders all of his artillery to get up there fast. There's no Federals on it. They're back down here, a little closer in, about halfway between here and that hill. And he gets his artillery in position. Nobody knows they're there. It's 
especially the families. So he gets up there. Uh, let's see. So Howard orders uh, Baxter's brigade to move forward and extend Cutler's line to the north towards Oak Hill. As this is unfolding, Howard's uh, rest of his local corps comes through cemetery uh, uh, through Gettysburg uh, on the run, leaving Adolf Steinbar's division, Steinbar Avenue, uh, and some artillery on Cemetery Hill south of the town. The rest of the corps moves north of Gettysburg into positions with Alexander Schimmelfinnick's division on the left and Brigadier General Francis Barlow's division on the right. And we'll see those positions a little later. The Federal line was stretched thin and did not connect with the right of First Corps, leaving a gap of a quarter of a mile. And it's going to be right up in this other area north of the railroad track. Uh, early that morning, A.P. Hill notified Richard Ewell that Hess Division was on the way to Gettysburg. Ewell ordered the division of Robert Rhodes and Jubal Early to head directly for Gettysburg instead of Cashtown, because that was where he was, had been told a couple of days earlier where to go to. Uh, shortly afterward, Ewell received a message from Lee approving the change, but warned against a general engagement until the rest of the army came up. And of course, this is one of those things. We didn't have radios back then. There was nothing like instantaneous messaging. The messages was a guy on a horse. You couldn't send a text. No, you couldn't send a text. <laughs> None of that. Uh, so, always your information is delayed X amount. How long it takes the message to get written out, get to the rider. The rider writes and finds the appropriate general and gives him the message, and then he's got to react to it. So, it, it can I'm, take a while. I imagine there was a constant people going everywhere yes. back and forth all the time yes. just it was constant <laughs> around lee's headquarters he probably had 20 25 couriers yeah yeah so they're going yeah Is it? Um, so uh roads approach on the heidelsburg road followed by early about two miles north of town roads turns west toward the mummersburg road and oak hill upon reaching oak hill Roach realized that he was on the flank of the Federal First Corps unopposed. He can see all the way down this line. And his, man, artillery, I can get the whole line of the Federal. Uh, so despite Lee's order not to bring an engagement, uh, Rhodes saw that this position was too good to pass up, especially with the act, action was already going on uh, to his front. While his infantry is deploying, Rhodes ordered his artillery to open fire on the Federal Force Corps line. And like I said, he was didn't know the Federals did not know he was there until he opened fire. And the Federals reacted quickly, refusing Baxter line. And of course, Love Corps now starts facing that way. Uh, without even a short, I need to get up. We need to go up there to hear this part. So anyway, so we're up here now. So this is, Go up this and is, take some pictures of us. Here. This gets to be one of the. Robert Rhodes is is a very adequate commander, but he gets up here after initially choosing this ground, getting his artillery in position. He blows it big time. Yeah. So this is what he does, without even a short reconnaissance or even throwing out skirmishers. Rhodes orders an assault. His best brigades under Junius Daniels, North Carolinian, on the right, and George Stoles on his left, they were held back from the assault. Your best guys. Uh, uh, Ramser's brigade was in reserve. He probably the next best. It fell upon his two weakest commanders. Brigadier General Alfred Iverson. Anybody know anything about Iverson? Yeah. You're going to find out in just a minute. Uh, on the right, and Edward O'Neill was on the left. So Iverson's here, and O'Neill's on the left. 
so they start off. Now remember, 11th Corps has turned their line back and they're facing this way. They're down here. Uh, and if you look over there, uh, you see a kind of tall, slender monument. Yeah. There's a line that the road goes through there. They're over there behind the uh, uh, rock. Oh. Yeah. We got to get over there next. Okay. Uh, the up here. Yeah. This attack was botched from the very beginning. Uh, both brigades were supposed to attack abreast, but Iverson delayed to allow the guns to soften up the Federals. O'Neill's brigade went in forward and alone, with O'Neill remaining in the rear, using only three of his five regiments and ran headlong into the full fire of Baxter's brigade, hidden behind a stone wall along the Mummersburg Road. Now, folks, I don't, I don't know about you, when you, when you attack, you go on, you put it all in, and he didn't, and he was very weak, and he stayed in the rear. Mind-boggling. Uh, the brigade suffered 696 casualties out of 688 men. Good. <laughs> Iverson belatedly moved forward, but he also remained behind. Now, doesn't that inspire your men with leadership? When two commanders stay in the dead gun rear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and since O'Neill's attack had collapsed, left his left flank exposed. In the interim between attacks, Baxter's men are shifted behind another stone wall running from the Mummersburg Road to the south. And that's what the line I was just telling you right there. Uh, and this is a quote from a man in the 23rd North Carolina. Unwarned, unled as a brigade, we went to our doom. Deep and long, that's the best of the range of the chairman of North Carolina proved the rashness of that power. The Federals waited until the Confederates were less than 80 yards to their front before opening fire. And at that range, probably almost none of their shots missed against the line of battle. Uh, over 500 men fell in a line as if on parade. Baxter's men now counterattacked and took almost 400 prisoners, effectively destroying Iverson's brigade. Now, Daniel and Ramser's brigades went forward. Daniel attacked on the far right, over this way, beyond the range of Cutler's men and hoped to get to the Chambersburg Road and flank Cutler. He was unaware of the railroad cut and was met by several Wallace of the 149th Pennsylvania. Both sides traded fire until they were locked in a stalemate. Daniel got no further than that. Ramser attacked straight down Oak Hill toward the south, right through here. Mm -hmm. Rose neglected to warn Ramser that Iverson had been ambushed here, and this would have happened to him also, except some of Iverson's survivors warned him. Ramser adjusted his line to the east to the right flank of the Federals. After intense fighting, the Federals were finally forced to withdraw from the Oak Hill area and retreat into Gettysburg. Now this area out here is it's about, if you look kind of kind of straight off, there's you see some green over toward the valley. You can see on the green then of some sort of a yellowish. That's the area that's called Iverson's Pits. Okay. And the Confederates there, they were all, those, all those casualties were just shot to pieces and they were buried there. The Federals buried them, or somebody buried them there. And this is always this day called Iverson's Pits. And there are people that believe in ghosts. They, that is one of the tallest places on the battlefield. I, for one, do not believe in ghosts. I've never experienced one. If you believe in ghosts, that's what I do. I don't. I don't believe in ghosts. That's fine. It's all in your mind. But anyway, that's Fred's opinion. Fred's entitled to it. If you don't agree with it, that's you're perfectly fine. <laughs> when we get to heaven, we'll find out. That's right. Um, so anyway, this is done. Now, the first core is already gone. They're, they've headed back into... Uh, now the 11th Corps is hit. One of their divisions is taking pretty hard in this area. We're going to go down in a few minutes. But while we're here, I want to point out some different cannon to you. This area. Okay. Now, by the way, this monument is the Eternal Light Monument. It was put up here in 1938 for the 75th anniversary of the battle. 
and there's always the work. Yeah, you still see it. Yeah. At night, it's beautiful. So, and you see it all over here. Yeah. Look at this way, you can see it. Uh, so that was done here. Franklin Roosevelt came and, and he dedicated the monument in 1938 to the 75th anniversary of the battle. Eternal Peace Monument. Uh, now, these different cannons. This one over here, you see, looks similar to those we saw this morning with the corner block. This is called uh, Whitworth. No, that's not a Whitworth. That's a uh, parrot. That's a parrot. It looks like it has a big band on the back yeah, of it. Yeah. And that's to handle some of the charges. Got metal at the time. They had a, when they initially designed that cannon, a lot of times they'd blow up or crack it. So they put those bands on them to strengthen the uh, breach end. Yeah. That's the way to tail them. It's a rifle cannon also. But a rifle cannon of those, uh, that size, generally had a range of 14 to 1600 yards after range. I could go a little farther, but that was pretty much their range. Now, now there were five originally. They were by, built by the U.S. military to bring soldiers here to study this battlefield. And from the five of them, you could see every, pretty much every inch of the battlefield. And this one does, with the other two, you have a dial in the center describing where everything is yeah. in certain directions, how far. Uh, Two of them are gone now, so they're still the three. These things were put up in the 1890s. And I'm 30 years old. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about up here. So we're talking about what's going on at Oak Hill. Going down here. This is Officer's Pits. Right out here, this kind of old area. Phoenix division over here. Yeah. And the neat thing, you know, you always, you always talk about the, 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 level, the Dutchman in the left corner. And again, there's Deutsch. Deutsch. German. And there were actual units in that corps that speak a word of English. Even the command, they all in German, they spoke in German, they everything in German. Only time they spoke is when the commander needed to speak to like corps commander or somebody else. Yeah. They all did it in German. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what's what's happening this way? This is Francis Barlow's division. Remember, Simple Phoenix Division, Barlow's division, and then of course Steinbar's division is still kept back here. Up on Cemetery Hill. See the church steeple. Yeah. All right. Hold up two fingers, arm's distance, and it's right side of your second finger, right in the top of the tree, you see a green water tower. And that's the cemetery. Okay. Okay. Big eminence, right straight over. See the part of the bottom is that Cullen's Hill. This big one over here is Brenner's Hill. Now you had Barlow's division stretched out across here. Not real good defensive ground, is it? No. Flat. There is a little bit of an eminence way over there at the far side. You see a yeah. little little yeah. tree yeah. and a little yeah. path? Yeah. That's called Barlow's Knoll. And if you want to go over there later, we, we can. We got time. We go over there. But that was the end of his line. And the end of his line was in, in the terms of the day was in the air, which means that it's not anchored on anything and it can be gotten around real easy. That's what's going to happen here. You're going to have uh, better troops out of Ewell's uh, Corps coming down. Rose Division is right here, uh, coming down through here. They're actually kind of coming on this uh, little road. And then the other side of 
back, we had Carlisle Road, and that's where Early's division is coming down. Carlisle, all coming from Carlisle. So he's moving down this road. It goes into action here. Uh, Barlow gets, well, this book. Driven off there because there's blank is in the air. They get the better troops are shooting around them. And they have to leave that. Marlow is severely wounded and left on the field. And this is a story of uh, John Gordon, engaged commander under Early. Uh, comes across him and finds him and offers some aid. And Marlow thinks he's going to die. And So you know, he gives him a little aid, gets some of the confederates to medical people, do something for him, look out for him. He was so badly wounded, they, they gave him back to the Federals. They thought he was going to die. Everybody thought he was going to die. He thought he was going to die. But he survived. And many years after the war, as the story goes, makes a good story whether it's true or not I'm not 100 percent sure I think I'm about most people are probably about 75 percent sure this happened but it sounds really good uh, after the war both Barlow and Gordon get elected to Congress and they're in Congress and this is probably 20 years after the war and uh, there was another general Gordon James Gordon from North Carolina that was a cavalry general that was killed during the war, you know, up from the Wilkesboro area. And uh, so Gordon feels pretty confident that Barlow died. Barlow knows that there's a General Gordon that died. He doesn't know that there's a General Gordon. He just says that John Beagle was So they meet in Congress, Barlow, Gordon, and one says to the other, during the war, I, I knew a, from Gordon, I knew a General Barlow, but, but he was killed at Ginsburg. And he says, no, I'm that man, I survived. And then Barlow says, well, I knew a General Gordon, that rendered me some aid, but he was killed later in the war. And Gordon says, no, that was me, I survived. And so, they had a reunion. <laughs> and both were shocked that the other survived. And they became friends after that. When you were talking about what kind of day we uh, early afternoon. Now, when they finally get pushed, well, there's nowhere to, they just stream back through the bank. Mm -hmm. They're getting out of Dodge best they can. And they rally on Cemetery Hill. Now, there's going to be something else. Troops coming up. There's other corps that are coming up from Pawnee Town. And Hancock gets here. Hancock and Superb gets here. And he's a corps commander, and he gets here, and Meade has met him on the way up and given him orders to take charge in Gettysburg. Reynolds has been killed. I want you to take charge of the battle. So uh, he gets up here, and in the most terms of time, he sees a highway and tells him that he's told me to make a man.
so Hancock, to, to move by this, kind of says, well, General Howard, since you were here first, I'll, I'll yield to you, but I would suggest <laughs> that you fully occupy this position and strengthen it. You know, this is the best ground for it. I would have you to say, okay, I'll bring you that. <laughs> so that's how Secretary Hill gets fortified. Three pounds, fast as they could, the survivors. There's a cemetery down there. Yeah, that's, I think. I think that some of some of that is like an arm cemetery. Like oh, that's what the sign on the cemetery it said. Is, I, I read that one right by. Hmm. And I think there was an arm house here somewhere. Yes, I, I remember being on a tour with somebody, and he showed me where it was. It's not very far out. Yeah, there. I, it, it, was either, it was somewhere. Yeah, right yes. between here and there, somewhere out here. Yeah. So this pretty much here was the end of the federal line. Yeah. End of the federal line, okay. It went that way and it stopped here. It went that way all the way over to Little Round Top. Yeah. Eventually. Well, you can do the math. Thousand men, thousand men in the front. Fifteen hundred. Yep. Feet. Yep. Five football fields. Yep. So, you know, it, it probably begs the... the the, the question, if I had been um, Howard, would it not have been more wise to fold my line back along the Mummersburg Road, yeah. back close to Gettysburg, so on the way out here? Because yeah. it's exposed. You're way out here. Yes, it's high ground, but there's nothing. Yeah. Like I say, the anger, it was in the air, but you never want to flank in the air. And Howard should have known what mm -hmm. your flank in the air should have been from yeah. Chancellorsville. Yeah. <laughs> His flank was in the air. Yeah. Big time. Oliver Howard has a bad habit of having a flank in the air. One armed Howard. He lost an arm early in the war. So what's that cemetery down here at the bottom of the hill? Yeah, I think it's the arm some of the poor folks cemetery mm -hmm. for Adams County. Okay. You quite Potter for you. Yeah. What's that? Potter's Field, okay. Palm Cemetery, yeah. Okay. Any other questions up here? Like I said, you didn't need to be up here long, just a few minutes, just see the position. Yeah. It didn't look like much of a knoll from the observation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean you know, from down there, you say it's a hill, but you yeah. get up here and he, he's out of troops. Yeah. He's not out of here. He's been on the creek down there, right at the base of the hill. A steep hill, that may have a little bit different. But he's still in that one. That was a road over there. High speed avenue of approach, modern no High speed avenue of approach in position. <laughs> That's a pretty good climb. Yep. If you're coming up, you're right into the front of the road. It may have been good ground, but he said, no, this is pretty untenable because if, if the Confederates come through right there, yeah. we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they were. <coughs> yeah. Because the Confederates just swarmed in. Yeah. Most of the town of Gettysburg and await word to continue their attack to drive the Federals from Cemetery Hill. Following A.P. Hill's Corps' attack west of Gettysburg that had driven the Federals in retreat through Gettysburg, Robert E. Lee watches the Federals scramble up through Cemetery Hill south of the town. Lee urged Hill to resume the attack to drive the Federals off of that dominant piece of ground. Hill, however, Citing the condition of his corps following the bloody attacks of the day declined. Now, I don't know about y'all, but my experience in the military, when a superior officer tells you to do something, you do it. And you have one other choice. Decide. Anyway, that leaves an attack on Cemetery Hill up to Ewell. The lead dispatches his aide, Major Walter Taylor to find Ewell and tell him that, quote, it's only necessary to press those people in order to secure possession of the heights. And Lee wished Ewell to carry the hill occupied by the enemy if he found it practicable. Now, I want to explain the term practicable. That has drawn a lot of talk about, well, that was a non-precise form. And it 
it was not precise, but it is perfect Robert E. Lee command style. And he was not the only, there were a lot of federals that gave, generals that gave orders, if practicable. Which it means, in military terms, you better pretty well do it unless it's just not under impossible. It's kind of like I, I tell people, I spent 30 years in the military and I never gave but two direct orders. I order you to do so-and-so. The rest of the time was, I wish you to do this. I desire for you to do this. I really would like for you to do this. Which most people that knew me, they knew that carried the weight of the direct order. It was kind of being nice about it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the use of the word practical has long been in debate and is a discretion of term. And like I said, it's not really given a hard order. Uh, but this is going on. Uh, but to Lee, this was a normal practice, especially since he was not in direct contact with Huell or that um, on that side of the battlefield, he did not know the end of the detail. Generally, Lee gave his supporters his, this discretion, trusting their ability. So this was the first battle after we reordered out the army and had two new untried corps commanders, Hill and you, his two weakest corps commanders. Uh, after Ewell's crash of the Federal Motor Corps, Ewell's troops had terribly bloody except Robert Rhodes divisions and casualties were relatively light in Major General Jubal Early's and Major General John Gordon's divisions. The Confederates observed Cemetery Hill, observing Cemetery Hill, found the Federals were there still unorganized and on Culp's Hill to the left there were no Federals at all. Instead of ordering a continuation of the attack and securing both of these hills, clearly dominating terrain, Ewell was in the Gettysburg Town Square chatting with several of his officers. Captain James Smith, one of Ewell's aides and formerly on Stonewall Jackson's staff, noted that Ewell, quote, chatted amiably with his men and noted nothing appeared pressing with Ewell. Later, Smith recalled, quote, but even then, some of us who were with Jackson sat in a group in our saddles, and one said sadly, Jackson is not here. Now, around 7 p.m., Lee was dismayed that Ewell had not lost his attack. He rode over towards Ewell's headquarters to find out why. Gordon had pressed Ewell to allow him to attack, but Ewell was gripped with some sort of strange inertia. Ewell told Gordon, General Lee told me to come to Gettysburg and gave me no orders to go first. This was an order that was given early that morning. How do you think the situation has changed? Uh, absolutely. Uh, for some strange reason, Ewell was referring back to the order that he received early that morning, but for a great change. A great battle had already been fought. and now not occupied as it ought to be by us or the enemy soon. I advise you to send a brigade to hold it if we are to remain here. You will reply, are you sure it commands the town? 
The man couldn't look. <coughs> well, he's talking about Culp's Hill. Or Eva Cemetery Hill. Both of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Trumbull becoming agitated after. Certainly it does, as you can see. And it ought to be held by us at once. You will look at Trumbull impatiently, and Trumbull's anger exploded. Give me one division, and I will take that hill. You will decline. Give me a one brigade, and I will do it. You will still decline. And Trumbull begged, give me one good regiment, and I will engage to take that hill. You will still sat denying the request. Trumbull rose up, threw down his sword, and stalked out of Ewell's headquarters, saying that he was no longer served by such an officer. Others in Ewell's corps shared the feeling that something had gone wrong. <clears throat> Some of the men realized something was amiss and shouted, let's go on. Colonel Jones of Avery's brigade reflected later, there was not an officer, not even a man, that did not expect that the war would be closed upon that hill that evening, for there were still two hours of daylight. Someone made a blunder and lost the Battle of Gettysburg and, humanly speaking, the Confederate cause. Yeah. Gordon also reflected, in less than half an hour, my troops would have swept up and over those hills and possession of which would have been of such momentous consequence. By the time Lee found Ewell, the moment had passed and it was too late to launch an attack. What had happened to Ewell? Some believe that Ewell's demeanor had changed when he lost a leg at 2nd Manassas. He was just back on active service with the Army and had been promoted to take over Jackson's old corps. He had performed well independently at Winchester on the way up defeating a sizable force of Federals there and capturing large numbers of prisoners, weapons, and supplies. Some will say that Gettysburg was really his first battle as part of the larger Army of Northern Virginia. Also, his present and former commander had different in styles of command. Now, the soldier in me is coming out here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, anyway, his present former commanders had different styles of command. Jackson, uh, under whom Ewell was a division commander, issued exact orders that were to be followed to the letter. Deviation could bring an arrest and a court-martial, which he did numerous times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about that later to, uh, when we get on to the third day's assault. Uh, remember General Garnett under Pickett? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was hobbled by being kicked that's why uh, and he couldn't walk so he had to ride and they said well surely you'll be a, a target we'll get to that more and but he said my honor requires me because he had done something that not he had withdrawn back he was over being overrun and he withdrew back and Jackson court martialed him or charged him because he had withdrawn without permission mm -hmm. and he never had a chance to get to court martial Jackson had died, so he said, my honor has never been restored. Anyway, honor is a terrible thing sometimes. Uh, hence his strict interpreta interpretation of Lee's order to come to Gettysburg. Lee, on the other hand, issued discretionary orders to his corps commanders, trusting them to be closer to the battle, to their front, and be able to adapt the orders to the situation as it demanded. Lee's use, both uh, use of the term practicable is in every command in his orders was uh, for the other commanders of both, and that was used by other commanders on both sides of the war. So was Ewell a culprit in the Confederate loss at Gettysburg? Yes. Oh, I thought we were. Go! Uh, yes! Yeah, yes! <laughs> yes! 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 yes. This shows you're awake in the end of this thing. All right, good deal. There were many uh, mistakes that caused the Confederate to lose at Gettysburg, but can one be isolated and pointed as the mistake? That discussion is still going on today, over 150 years after the event. It is most likely a combination of mistakes, even though a few by, uh, of the mistakes by themselves, if reversed, could 
it'll change the outcome and maybe even the outcome of the war. But to many scholars of the battle, the failure to take Cemetery and Culp's Hill from a broken and dispirited, dispirited federal army may rank as one of the largest. May not be the one, but it is certainly, to me, one of the largest. Several years after the war, Ewell was asked about the defeat at Gettysburg. I think his answer is as good as any. It took a great many mistakes to lose the Battle of Gettysburg, <coughs> and I believe I committed many of them. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to Stonewall Jackson. Let's go back to Stonewall Jackson. But we still really don't know why he didn't attack. It's all speculation. My speculation is, is he was still believing in that strict interpretation of the order, like Jackson. Mm -hmm. This is his first battle actually under Lee as part of the large army. He had done a magnificent job coming up to Winchester, but that was his independent, he was the boss. He made the decision. Uh, here, he was part of the army and that. Now, Randall takes the opinion, well, he had marched all the way from Carlisle, and the men were tired, and they had had a battle, and he just thought they couldn't go anymore. Let's go back to Jackson. We've got to find that page. It's full of Jackson's quotes and stuff about the command. Ah, here we go. Uh, this is what Jackson, one of his... Um, mottos about that. Always mystify. Mislead and surprise the enemy if possible. And when you strike and overcome him, never let up in pursuit as long as your men have strength to follow. For an ar army routed, if hotly pursued, becomes panic-stricken and can be destroyed by half their number. The master himself. Mm -hmm. Won't come in on what some people thought about Ewell's leadership. He always wanted to be confirmed uh, in his orders by another officer, uh, another officer's judgment before putting his own ideas into operation. Uh, now, this is Lee's strategy for up here. When they hear uh, where we are, they will make force marches and propose their forces between us and Baltimore and Philadelphia. They will come up, probably through Frederick, broken down with hunger and hard marching, strung out on a long line, and much demoralized when they come into Pennsylvania. I shall throw an overwhelming force on their advance, crush it, and follow the success drive one corps back on another, and by successive repulses and surprise before they can come and concentrate, create a panic, and virtually destroy the army. Perfect. Perfect. Army become much larger, but you knock out a little section of it, knock out a little section of it, you whittle it down. Now, whose quote was that, sir? That was that was Lee's strategic plan. Sounds like about. a good plan to me. Excellent plan to me. No offense, buddy. Why now, you will, by that? now, this is what you all had was quoted as saying, and, and I've already said this a little bit. General Lee told me to come to Gettysburg and gave me no orders to go further. I do not feel like advancing and making a claim without orders from him. And he getting back at Cash Town. That's why you get paid the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes make tough decisions. Have I made tough military decisions? I have. Yeah. Got people killed. And I still remember that. Yeah. It's hard, but it was the right decision to make. Unfortunately, war is an ugly business. Okay. And again, 
uh, this quote. Uh, let's see. I've already made these two quotes. They were from uh, Colonel Jones of Avery's Brigade and also from John B. Gordon. Uh, so, uh, this is pretty much closing the first day. Uh, the situation is this. A definite Confederate victory, but like so many times, not a complete victory. He 
Taylor is playing Longstreet around 10 o'clock. He told Longstreet that I think you better move on. Lee then rode over to Ewell to tell him in his part of the plan. Lee thought that before he returned from seeing Ewell that Longstreet's attack would be underway. And he fought, said to one of his staff members, what can detain Longstreet? He ought to be in position by now. Lee returned to his command post and was dismayed that Longstreet had not only not started the attack, but had not even begun to move his troops. Uh, Longstreet told Lee that he uh, was waiting for Law's brigade of McClaw's division to arrive. He did not uh, arrive until noon, and it was then that Longstreet finally began to move. How long is this after Longstreet was told to move? 10 o'clock. It's now 12 o'clock. It is amazing to note that during Longstreet's waiting, there was no record of his dispatching anyone to recon the route to the attack position. Thus, when he finally moved, his route en encountered several problems. Longstreet's initial route was to march back up to the Chambersburg Pike to Marsh Creek, which is three miles back that way, turn left and march along a small road that led to the Hagerstown Road. At this point, he would turn east toward the Emmitsburg Road, and after marching only a short distance along the Hagerstown Road, Longstreet's leading brigade under Joseph Kershaw realized that they would be seen by the Federals that had, when they crossed over her ridge. Longstreet came back, visibly agitated, directed that the force countermarch back to the Chambersburg Pike. Now let me tell you a little bit for those of you that don't reenact what a countermarch is. It's not that everybody stops about facing marching. It's whoever in the very beginning turns around and everybody just follows around. So it's it's an incredibly time-consuming and wasteful. Anyway. Uh, so they would come back to Chambersburg Pike, turn right and, and turn off and march along Willoughby Run to get in position. Now Willoughby Run is down there where uh, Pettigrew Brigade went in. The delay cost dearly in the taking of about two hours and caused the troops to endure several miles of additional marching. Thus, it was around 3.30 p.m. when Longstreet's Corps finally began deploying into their attack position. It should be noted that Longstreet's artillery, led by Porter Alexander, found a way over her ridge not being detected and wondered why the infantry did not follow him. This goes back to not doing a recon. Yep. You always do a dead dumb recon. Yeah. Anyway. It had been around 10 hours since Lee's scouts had determined that there were no Federals on the round box. It had been around five and a half since Lee issued the order. It had been three and a half hours since Longstreet began his movement. Given that the Federals were still arriving in Gettysburg, is it any wonder that the situation had drastically changed on the Federal side of the line? And this change would likewise have drastic consequences Schutz, Schertz of the Lovett Corps. 
Shirts asked me about how many shirts they would have, and they replied, in the course of the day, I expect to have around 95,000 troops, enough for the business at hand. Uh, he then added, well, we may as well fight it out here as anywhere. By 9 a.m., a much larger, larger portion of the Army of the Potomac had arrived. On the federal right, which is back this way, Henry Slocum's 12th Corps was posted on the right of the Battery 1st and 11th Corps from Culp's Hill to Rock Creek. And that's what we're going to be over there kind of tomorrow. Uh, Hancock's 2nd Corps was on the left of the 1st Corps, extending down Cemetery Ridge. Dan's 2nd Corps was to come into line on the left of 2nd Corps. George Sykes' 5th Corps was in reserve along the Baltimore Pike behind Cemetery Hill, and John Sedgwick's 6th Corps would not arrive until late in the day. On the previous evening, part of Brigadier General John Geary's division of 12th Corps had been detached to cover the extreme left of the Federal line. Two of his regiments had spent the night on Little Round Pop. At 5 a.m., Geary was ordered to return to 12th Corps, leaving Little Round Top empty. This position was to be reoccupied by 3rd Corps, Sickles Corps. Geary, realizing the importance of the hill, sent an aide and later a message to Sickles explaining how critical this position was to defense. Sickles replied only by saying that he would attend to it in due time. Geary wanted, uh, waited as long as he could, but soon had to leave, leaving Little Round Top empty. And this is when Lee's two aides on their recon discovered there's nobody on the Round Tops. Mm -hmm. By 6 a.m., Meade sent his aide, his son George, <coughs> to see if Third Corps was in position. Sickles told him he was not sure where he was to be, and, and after reporting this, Meade sent his son back to tell Sickles to occupy Geary's old position. By now, Sickles was not concerned by the round tops by what he saw to his front. Through a line of trees, Sickles saw a peach orchard on a slight hill about a half mile to his front that could command the position. He requested that Meade come over and look for himself. When Meade did not show after a couple of hours, Sickles rode over to consult with Meade. Meade was noncommittal, and Sickles asked if he had the authority to use his judgment in placing his men. Meade replied, Certainly, within the limits of the general instructions I've given you, any ground within those limits you choose to occupy, I leave to you. Meade sent his artillery chief, Brigadier General Henry Hunt, back with Sickles to survey the situation. Hunt agreed that Sickles, with Sickles at the hill with the Peach Orchard was an attractive position. He felt that it constituted a favorable position for the enemy to hold. This was one good reason for our taking possession of it. Sickles asked permission to take it, but Hunt added, Not on my authority. I will report to General Meade for his instructions. So Sickles sent out skirmish to see if any Confederates were to his front. They were part of Colonel, Colonel Hiram Burdan's sharpshooters, supported by the 3rd Maine. They advanced across the Emmitsburg Road and found Confederate skirmishers. The sharpshooters the sharp drove them back they reached Pitcher's Woods ran into more substantial Confederate force. The sharpshooters then pushed back, or then pulled back and reported the sickles of the other Confederates to their front. These were part of Cadmus Wilcox's Alabama Brigade of A.P. Hill's Corps, not part of Longstreet's Corps. They had not yet arrived. This was all the sickles needed. At around 3 p.m., he sent his corps forward to occupy out to the Emmitsburg Road and the Peach Orchard. Observers in 2nd Corps to their right noticed how fine they looked moving forward, but many knew in their heart that this was a mistake. The entire 3rd Corps was now stuck out way into the front of the rest of the Army and exposed the left flank of 2nd Corps. General Hancock told his staff around him, wait a moment. See them 
ball jumps off the back. Meade, unaware of the movement, had ordered a meeting of his corps commanders. Sickle sent word that he could not attend as he was moving his corps. Meade sent another order demanding that Sickles appear. You generally don't tell your commander I'm busy like me. <laughs> yeah, it's either obey or resign, yeah. right? Yeah. So as Sickles <laughs> arrived, guns began firing on the Federal left. Meade told Sickles to return to his corps. Meade now decided that he needed to make a personal visit to the left of the third corps lines. Meade found Sickles in the peach orchard and could barely contain his noted temperature. Ooh. Now, Meade was kind of a Snapping rough individual. <laughs> Some people called him a goggle-eyed old snapping turtle. You know, and, he, and he told Sickles, General, I'm afraid you're out too far. When Sickles tried to explain about higher ground, Meade cut him off and replied, this is, this is excellent. General Sickles, this is in some respects higher ground than that you were in your rear, but there is still higher ground in front of you. And if you keep on advancing, you will find constantly higher ground all the way to the mountains. <laughs> so Sickles offered to re redeploy his corps back to his former position, but a shell landed close by. Nick Meade shouted to Sickles, I wish to God you could, but those people are not going to permit it. And with that, Meade's horse bolted to the rear, and Sickles was left to fight it out where he was, bad position or not. Now, there are a lot of people say that that was a stupid move. But, and in a lot of ways it was, but you know, there are some people that really look at this thing and they have offered this and it's not that outlandish that by Sickles doing that, he sacrificed his core, but it bought the Army of the Potomac a lot of valuable time in delaying the Confederate assault, which it did. Who knows? There's a North Carolina monument. To be sure he's gonna stop here. I think he's going down further than the first thing. North Carolina, Virginia. No, it's not Virginia, it's uh Tennessee. So let me show you this is represent I use these for for uh, a little bit training aids, low tech training aids that describe civil war air tactics. When I'm doing low level stuff, this is this is a company and uh in line of battle, turning that way, it's the company in column or marching by the flank. But today they're going to represent a brigade. Each one of them is going to be a brigade. So how these things work, a brigade in echelon, you have your brigades in line of battle. And they're told to go forward. So if the command would be something like this. Uh, attack by brigades and echelon much, yeah. from the right at a 200 yard interval and that would be what the command would be given or instead of 200 yard if you wanted it to be 10 minute interval 15 minute interval that's what you would say but that's the way the command would be given from the division commander to the brigade commanders so let's just say it's distance so it starts from the right, he said from the left, you start on this end, and they go forward first. <laughs> so the attack on the We're right. We're facing the enemy. Enemy this way. <laughs> right there. Okay. Just, I just like they are in real, yeah. life, real life. Over gotcha. there. Yeah. So this brigade would start. And it starts <coughs> right here. And let's say it's 200 yards, and let's just say this is 200 yards. When they get to 200 yards, this brigade starts. Mm -hmm. And then this one starts. I don't have but two hands, so I've got to kind of move this. And then eventually this one starts. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do. And what the thought behind this is, is that the enemy will see these guys coming out first, or maybe even these guys together, say, that's where the attack is. So let's rush there to meet him. And they start pulling a lot of troops from over here to get right in front of them. And hopefully what happens is, at some point, because this was not just a one division attack, it was everybody. The whole line was to do this, all the way from down here 
all the way back up through AP Hills Corps up into the town of Gettysburg. Uh, so at some point it was thought that somebody could break through. There'd be a thin spot where they'd be, still be moving and you can attack and get right through. So that was a, it was used quite a lot and it was successful, but there's two or three things that have to happen to this. On both sides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it was a common tactic. Okay. Uh, division level and higher. Okay. Uh, so it's, comp it's a little complicated. You've got to have somebody that probably would ride along and coordinate it. So a staff officer that the overall command of trucks would say, start. And if it's time, he sits there and watches the watch and says, next brigade, go. Or if it's distance, somebody estimates the distance. Next brigade, go. And you keep going right down the line and you keep it going. The other problem with it is, it takes a long time to develop, especially if you've got a two core level of attack. This thing needed to go no later than 12 noon. It's gonna be way late in the afternoon before it ever starts at all. And where it's gonna start is gonna be way down here. It's gonna be Hood and uh, get the draws to the Now, let's get back in the book. Great book. Uh, not a good book, but a great book. Lee was still under the impression that there was no federal troops down here. Of course, just so you see, it's a little bit low, but you can see the little rocky hill. That's a little round top. Mm -hmm. See it right in front of us? It's yeah. kind of yeah. hidden. Yeah. And of course, that's big round top. The wooded one. The big one. Big <laughs> round top. <laughs> Aptly named. <laughs> uh, it wasn't covered in trees back then, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. These are right. exactly what it looks. And in so. fact, it's lucky we planned this when we did, because I was just reading. Uh, a couple of days ago, that the Park Service is going to close all of Little Round Top in about two, three weeks. Well, they haven't done it yet. And and yeah. they're going to, as far as I know, they Good. may have already. I hadn't heard yet when they but, were doing uh, it. But I thought they said it was still going to be open until about the end of this month. And then they're going to close it for several months and completely fix it like it was then. All on this front side, there's some brush and trees and stuff up. Fix the paths going down and everything and the little trails and the other thing they're going to fix is parking. It's a nightmare to park. Oh, it is. It's, in it's the summer hard. you can't get, you can't get in the place. And, and all the walking paths, the roots are growing yeah. up and yeah. people. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so Lee orders Longstreet to take the little rocky hill. Longstreet's forward attack on the right, uh, along with part of Hill's Corps, Anderson and Pender's division. Ewell's Corps would demonstrate and try to assault against Cups Hill on the left. And remember, he said, when you hear Longstreet start his attack, that's when you start yours. Only about two miles away, but you're going to run into a difficulty in a little while. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Uh, Another little aside, around noon on July 2nd, guess who appears on the battlefield? Stuart. Stuart. Jeb Stuart finally arrives. Uh, it was said that all the first day, Lee would go by and he'd run into some staff officer or some curious of it. Have you seen General Stewart? Has anybody seen General Stewart? What? I cannot imagine what has happened to General Stewart. I'm blind without General Stewart. I don't know what I'm facing up here. And he did. So Lee was at a distinct disadvantage because he had almost no cavalry here. A few little scattered detachments he had with him, but they were not a significant force. Could Lee may have used them a little better? It's possible but they were very small, um, not as reliable a cavalry as Jeff Stewart and his veteran cavalry. Uh, so when he shows up, uh, Lee was extremely angry and told Stewart, I have not heard a word from you in days and you are the eyes and ears of my army. 
Now, Stewart tries to defend himself. And in his big ride around, he had captured a federal wagon, supply wagon train of 125 wagons and teams. And of course, he captured them and brought them along with him. What do you think that did to the speed of his column? Mm -hmm. Slowed it down. Slowed it down, mm -hmm. the wagon train speed. Uh, and he said, well, General, I brought you 125 wagons and their teams. And Lee told him, yes, but they are an impediment to me now. And after calming down a bit, Lee told Stewart, let me ask your help now. We, must, we will not discuss this matter further. Help me fight these people. And that was Lee. He would get upset. He got it out, said what he needed to say, and it was time to move on. Yeah. It's done. It's done. We're moving on. I need your help now. And that's the way he always was. Uh, and... I got a note here. Just is uh, this is about what Meade told Sickles about his corps moving out. Extend your corps to the left of Little Round Top, provided it is practicable to occupy it. <laughs> so he, like I said, he the, they all used the same word. Practical was very common use in orders. It is not that big bugaboo that a lot of people think it is. It's just not. Anyway. Uh, so the Confederate position had Hood's division on the far right. And we'll go down there a little bit later, not, not just a few minutes. On the far right, opposite the Round Tops, and Lafayette McLaws division opposite the Peach Orchard. Right here. That's the Peach Orchard right there. Mm -hmm. The little low trees you see in the distance, yeah. a couple of big trees. Peaches. That's the Peach Orchard. Right there where you see that car zipping down the road. Light like green trees. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, across the way, the Federals were finally gaining strength along Cemetery Ridge. Arriving along the ridge shortly after Don Hancock's second corps connected to the 11th corps on Cemetery Hill, Sickles' third corps on Hancock's left, uh, and supposedly to the base of Little Round Top. Long, Longstreet's slowness had allowed the Federals much more time for reinforcements and had changed the situation from what Lee's aides had told him. Uh, so Hood saw this in his orders. He didn't like it, and he said, uh, I protest this. That is a steep hill. It's full of rocks. I, I can't carry my formations up that. It's going to come all to pieces. You need to let me go around to the right. You know, from the movie. Should have gone around to the right. And uh, there was something to that because mm -hmm. if you if you if were to slip all the way, mm -hmm. if you could and slip all the way around the right at the base of the right of Little Round Top and got around, guess what was behind the Round Tops? Federal supply trains, Federal Reserve artillery limbered up, not ready to deploy. Lots of it sitting there on the Baltimore Pike. Anyway, uh, so. Well, why did he throw Stewart around there? What? 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 Stewart, Stewart had just got there and they were wild. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. worn out, so mm -hmm. we had to wait till they... they... I mean, they had ridden about 120 miles in the last four days. In fact, they had been up at Carlisle, which before the war was the U.S. Army Cavalry School. So, Stewart had been there. He came, he came up there and staged a little parade to announce that the Confederate Cavalry is now in Carlisle. The uh, show, uh, show, the US show and Army tell. Cavalry yeah. School. Uh, and when a a courier or somebody that Lee had sent out searching finally found him, and he said, "You need to get to Gettysburg fast as you can. General Lee's looking for you. He is not happy." <laughs> uh, I think there's probably stronger words than that, but that, was, that that got the gist of the So anyway, so he gets here. And uh, they're, they're just, we're out. 
for all that riding. Uh, they've been on the move for pretty much the last week and a half. Uh, any questions? Peach Orchard. In Union Center, out about that way. Up here. Well, the trees are a little bit up there, but you can kind of see a little round top, a little big round top, yeah. yep. kind of plant up an area. And of course, the hood kept saying, "Go around." I need to go around. I need to go around. And hood uh, challenged Longstreet and said, "General Longstreet." I must protest. The ground you're going to send me over is that thing there. It said it's not under impossible. Look at all those rocks. The enemy's going to be behind every rock firing at us. And it's uphill. It's, why can't we go right through here? And this is Longstreet. This is his attitude. We can't do that. General Lee has said we're going to attack there. And that's where we're going to attack. No ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah. <laughs> and to me, it's that still that pouting attitude. Could he have overridden? Huh? Could he have overridden and Who? say, yeah, I mean, Longstreet tell Hood? He wouldn't have. But I mean, if he wasn't pouting, do you think he still would have or um, could have? Because he knows it's better that way, too. Well, but yeah, of course. The thing but I know is, it's an order and order. The, 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 the whole situation has totally changed. See, Lee is still back up, yeah, and he's assuming that there's no Federals down here. And at this time, they're not. And, of course, everybody's saying, well, you know, if we could actually get up on Big Round Top and get a battery up there, Wait, Don could do the... could fire that just like Oak Hill from the north. This could fire that. Don could do a there good There's no path good. to get up there on that thing. And yeah. we go around mm -hmm. there, it's trees and leaves. But I want you to look up that slope. I want you to look up through there on big round top. It would have been non impossible to get a battery up there. Yeah, you couldn't have fired because there's old trees in front of everything. So it's, you know, but there are actually federals, a few federals on top of a little round top. I mean, big round top and around. It's now occupied. The little round top is not occupied except for a signal station, a big station. And that's all that's over there. So Hood finally tells, uh, he finally tells Hood, you will attack as you have been ordered. And Hood says, I protest, it. I do this under protest. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna launch the attack and start this way. So the brigade from over here on the right is gonna start first. And it's, and it's Law's Alabama Brigade. Yeah. Now Law is gonna attack and he's actually gonna go for big round top. That's his target, big town target. So he's headed straight yonder. Uh, the next brigade in line is, I got to look on my list, but there to go about where this little farm you see right down here, a little farm, that's kind of going right through that. The next brigade down will go uh, sort of into where the uh, uh, Devil's Den is. And we're gonna leave from here and we're gonna end up going to Devil's Den next all right so we're gonna go around and like i say go slowly and no, if 
as best you can, look at, at big brown top and see what that looks like going up that thing. It's hum humongous boulders all over that. <coughs> Bigger than a little round top. Uh, but we're going to go up there. We'll get down to a little cross <coughs> and Excuse take me. a left down. Okay. Uh, I got a pistol take care of. I got another way too. Now remember, Park Service. The brigades are attacking. Law's brigade is attacking up big round top. And the more brigades coming right across, coming right through here, coming through the Devil's Den. And uh, Don asked me a little while ago, did I know where Hood was wounded? Yes, I do. Over there, and I'll show you when we get over there, uh -huh. back around. Uh, but we'll do this now. Now, in all this attack, there's nobody up here except the small signal station. And Governor Warren is right down there, got a statue of him down. He was a signal officer, you know, doing the wigwag thing. Because you can see right down there, you can see all the way to the other end of the battlefield. You can see every bit of it. So uh, he's up here, and all of a sudden he thinks in that woods over there, he sees <coughs> flashing metal. What's generally flashing metal? Bayonets. Swords. Bayonets. 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 And their fifth corps guys coming onto the field to fill in on up here. And he goes down there and he starts asking, I need some troops now. I need some troops to occupy this hill. I need somebody now. I need somebody now. I need somebody now. And nobody will take the initiative except there's a brigade commander by the name of Strong Benson. He's a colonel this day, but he's a, he's a, has a brigade. Yep. On his own initiative. He peels off and says, I'll send my brigade. Now, he didn't have his he didn't ask his division commander if he could pull out. He did not, but he said, they need help there and I will do it. So he pulls his regiment off. And these five regiments for the rest of the war have any one of them has the name of a little round top regiment. That was kind of like a badge of honor. You were a little round top regiment. So they start coming up this hill now. On now this hill. Are we on big round top? Or little, this is little round. Little, little, little round. Big round top. Okay. Now, just about the time that they start coming up the hill here, Oates is over here and he's at the top of big round top, and he looks out across and he says, "This commands the entire battlefield. If I get little round top." The war's over. Or so he thought. So, in 10 minutes, he orders his men to start moving down the hill. Now, they had to stop and rest a little bit. They were, they were wore out climbing up that hill. I'm sorry, all this, all the leaves, you can't see how bad that terrain is up big round top. And, and they did have to push off a small unit contingent up there. I think it was a company or something up there. They pushed them off. So they, they waited about 10 minutes to catch their breath. And they were about out of water. So they got a water detail together. A water detail is one guy gets about six, eight canteens and it starts taking off somewhere to find water. Probably one of these creeks back down here. So they move down the hill, start moving down the hill. Meanwhile, Vincent's brigade is coming up here. And they file in here, kind of along the top here, around and around the side. Uh, and go to, and we're gonna go back down where the 20th main was just a few minutes. So they file in and go back down here. Vincent comes down there to 
Chamberlain, who has a 20th Maine, they end up being the very far flank yeah. regiment. Yeah. Uh, around 300 men. We're going to go down there and see where they were. We're, we're going to go down there. Okay, that's good. All right. yeah. uh, because it's nothing like what's in the movie. Yeah. That's one time the movie screwed it all up, but they don't get it right. But anyway, so they get around here, back to law. He's coming down the hill with his men to get here. And in that 10 minutes, Vincent's brigade gets in position here. Uh, and we remember the little scene where uh, Chamberlain gets put in position and Vincent tells him, you are the end of the line. You understand, and it, that was, that's pretty well done. You understand it's it. If they get around you, the entire Union Army is flanked and we are defeated. You understand that. He, he got what we call a die in place mission. In other words, you don't leave it. You die in place. They're not good missions to get. So he's down here. We're going to go down a little while. So laws starts coming up and he yeah. runs into that and we'll we'll cover that a little more detail we'll go back meanwhile down here there are more of those confederate units starting to come up this hill here and uh they're running into a lot of resistance because their union troops are you can't see it very well but there's a couple little rock walls that they have put up down here for cover and they're behind them and this is uh, fighting coming up right here now this is, they've already, uh, the Confederates have already taken Devil's Den at this point. But they have sharpshooters over there. There was about half a dozen Federal commanders that are shot dead up here. You stuck your head up, you got yeah. killed. Yeah. Uh, numerous. Yeah. Including, toward the end of this thing, Strong Benson is mortally wounded. Yeah. Uh, he survived into the night, and he is promoted to Brigadier General So this is where the 20th Maine comes down to. This is their left flank, uh, pretty much right down here. Now, look at this ground right here. And does this look like anything that was in the movie, the ground? Absolutely not. It looked like they pushed them for two miles down the hill. It's less than 100 yards to the bottom of the hill. Yeah, that scene lasted forever when they, when they fixed the bayonets and charged them. Now, so they were they were arrayed back up this way and there was a mark a little, just a little ways back up that said right flank when you think. So this yeah. is where they were. Take a picture of the monument uh, down there. They were here and like I said, they had a dying place mission. I saw the left flank marker right yeah. over here. So they get in down here and uh, 
Again, you know, strong Vincent's Brigade, fifth corps. And uh, Vincent Cole Chamberlain, this is the left of the Union, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, let's go back a little bit. And Oates was ordered forward to take Little Round Top. As the troops started up the slope here, they were met by the most destructive fire I ever saw. Uh, my line wavered like a man trying to walk against a strong wind. The veterans were repulsed, reformed, and charged again. Uh, the guy in the 20th Maine stated again and again this mad rush repeated each time to be beaten off by the ever thinning line and desperate that desperately clung to its ledge of rocks. Finally out of ammunition. And Chamberlain had sent couple of people to see if anybody else can spare any ammo and everybody said we're in the same shape we're fighting as hard as we can too you're on your own so Chamberlain's down here told you can't leave you're out of ammunition what do you do George fix bayonets it's the only thing left and it's a desperate move by a desperate man and a desperate unit uh, so he ordered, again, fixed bayonets. In the movie, it shows Chamberlain ordering charged bayonets. He did not do that. It was one of his lieutenants, Herman Melchior, did that. Now, a little bit. Quite this. Chamberlain, to try to protect his flank, sent his F Company, which was only about 25 men, down this way about 50 yards and said, turn perpendicular across the end in case they try to come around us. Not a not an unwise move. But what it did is it took F Company out of the fight. And the F Company was saw what was happening over here and was very happy to be out of the fight. They did not fire the entire time. We're being left alone. Let's leave it that way. Okay. <laughs> so they get down here, and the Confederates keep hitting a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more to the left every time they come up the hill. So Chamberlain says, I, I need to extend my line. So one of the things he does is he refuses his line. He thins out to one man thick, not two ranks, but one rank, and refuses the line, and they, they turn back and come back somewhere along up in here where we are and, and turn back maybe left bank marker is clear down there right right there okay yeah. i'm not going to turn all the way around i'm on an aisle so i'm not going to turn the left bank you can't see now it's behind that stone wall right there okay but it was there and they refused the line which means for those of you that don't reenact refusing a line means if you're like this you turn you turn something back to try to protect them from flanking you so easy like this yeah it's Turn like back. a hinge you, you, and you come back now when they get ready to do their charge again it's Herman Melchior lieutenant that or actually leads the attack Chamberlain does not lead the attack and they do push the Confederate but now one thing that the movie shows <coughs> that did not happen and this was for real about the time they order the charge, and it's only right here, Oates finally decides we don't have any water because the water detail hasn't gotten back with any water. They're out of water. And these guys are thirsty. It's hot July afternoon. So he decides we can't take the position. <clears throat> so he orders them to withdraw back up the hill over there a ways. As they're withdrawing on their own with main charges, into an empty space. <clears throat> they get to the bottom of the hill, no Confederates, and they start up the other side. 20 yards up the other side, they ran into some angry Confederates that were waiting for them. <laughs> Fired into them, causing numerous casualties. The 20th Maine retreats back up to here and they sit. They don't move again. <laughs> they get behind these rocks and they stay there. Now, have they stopped the Confederates? Yes, because Oates, is, they're just out too. They're just war slam out too. They're, they're both just wrung out. The 
20th Main rung out out of ammunition and rung out so they just sit here they have fought each other to a standstill both sides yeah did this position remain in federal hands yes it did interesting thing about Joshua Chamberlain he did win the Medal of Honor for the action this day here I, I probably deserve I'll give him that but he was largely forgotten to a degree now he's he there's few extra things in the siege of Petersburg and all that he he does a couple things in there that's pretty pretty good too but he is largely forgotten to history until Michael Schauer writes the killer angels mm -hmm. and that resurrects him and there is an entire cult following behind Joshua Chamberlain mm -hmm. is it deserved you form your own opinion. It's up to you. I, some of it's deserved. I don't think all of it is. But Pam some of it is. Pamplin Park, they had a whole, that whole room was nothing but 20th Main. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> pictures. But that's, and that's But see, uh, Michael Shar's book, Killer Angels, and then movie Gettysburg, The Sun Rises and Sets in Joshua Chamberlain. Was he important? Yes. Did he do some good things? Yes. Is he the savior of Little Round Top? I, I think that's open for debate. They make him the savior of Gettysburg. Well, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the Top. Union Army and yes. the war yes. between the states. But not quite so. So uh, after the action here, and it shows them moving up to Big Round Top. No, they did not. They, they pretty much stayed here. Did they move over onto the battle, in the center of the battlefield? Yeah, they got moved over there. And I, I do like that, the, the aide that comes over and gets them says, oh, we're gonna move you, uh, Colonel Chamberlain, over to this very quiet spot of the battlefield. Not, nothing has ever happened over there. But I don't, I don't think it was quite what showed in the movie because like he was you know, in the middle of, I, not quite, but they, they were moved over there. How many did they have left in their lines when they went over to that area? Again? Less than a hundred. Less than a hundred, okay. Yeah. Mm. And uh, again, what they did was important. They did anchor this on, they did hold it uh, against repeated Confederates assault and Law's Brigade was a pretty good brigade in Hood's division. Now, any questions about over here, little round top? I'm assuming these works here, they're... They were pretty much put up in just a few minutes. But I mean, are they pretty much original or somewhat placed in the same? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was going on while Sharpshooters were at Devil's Yeah, up there, and, rock, and, no and after rock. the assaults, there were more rocks put up. Because, <coughs> you know, when you're in a defensive position, you never stop improving the position until the enemy stops you from doing it. Yeah. Now, was Sickles already run back to the line? Not yet, the, not yet. Not yet. We, we come into that. Okay. But remember, we're brigades in echelon. There. Brigades in echelon. Hadn't got to it yet. Okay. These brigades are still tripping down the line here. Now we're gonna go leave here and we're gonna go back and we're hopefully we'll turn to the left at the little crossroads down here and go down to the next little road to the left and that'll carry us to the Devil's Den. And then we're gonna Extreme Union left right here, all the way back. You see the Union wall where the 20th Main is here is where they made the famous hook. Right here is where the wall was where they all 
rent. And they, and they bring that point out right there. Or they show you that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Robertson's and Benning's brigades attacked the Devil's Den. Fighting became muzzle to muzzle, some using their bayonets to stab around the corners of the rocks. Uh, when the Confederates finally took Devil's Den, they used it for the rest of the battle to sharpshoot anybody on top. A little round top, yeah. and they took a terrible toll. Let me tell you some of the leaders that were killed up here. Uh, Strong Vincent, Patrick O'Rourke, who was 140th New York, Stephen Weed, who was brigade com another brigade commander in Fifth Corps, Lieutenant Charles Hazlitt, uh, who his battery was, and that was the battery that was up on mm -hmm. represented up on top of Little Round Top. Okay. Uh, so, Don asked me where was Hood wounded. About 50 yards right straight out in front of us. Mm -hmm. That's where he was wounded. Yeah, on horseback. And, it, you know, it was a, a terrible arm wound. Um, and when he got him out there, he, he lost the use of that arm. It, he didn't lose the arm, but he lost the use of it. It was pretty much just hung for the rest of his life. Um, Hood had lived a pretty charmed life up to this point. Hmm. After this, it all went to heck in a handbasket. Because he, he gets recovered from his arm wound, and he ends up going down with Longstreet down to Atlanta, and that, the campaign down there in Georgia. And uh, he gets wounded again in the leg, and he loses the leg. So hmm. he's, and it's pretty high. So to get him in a saddle, he has to be helped by others up onto the saddle and strapped on. Yeah. And then he's got that. You got to get help to get down too, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and a lot of people say one of his problems, he was in such pain that he was on laudanum, which is a variation of an opioid. Yeah. And that was a big thing back in those days. You know, people were in pain a lot. They got laudanum. Well, he wasn't very old, was he? Not terribly old. Because he was what? 30s. Yeah. Late 30s. Uh, and, and he had pretty, after the war, it, it, well, you know, he went on to come, uh, after Johnson was uh, removed as commander of the Army of Tennessee, uh, Jefferson Davis made Hood commander of the Army. And he destroyed the Army between Franklin and yeah. uh, Nashville. Yeah. He destroyed the Army of Tennessee. Yeah. Yep. And uh, that was a shame. Yeah, and uh, you know I think that plagued him. And then after the war, he went back home. And within a, two or three years, I think he was now close to uh, New Orleans. Yellow fever struck, k killed his whole family except him. Hmm. And he he did not live but another two or three years, and then he died. Hmm. And I now I could tell you what killed him, but he died of something, obviously. Um, just sad. Yeah. Just sad. So many of these guys. They did take this position, but they just couldn't get it all. Mm. Now, the brigades keep attacking. They're coming this way through here, attacking. We're going to go down here and we're going to go to the wheat field mm -hmm. next.